Hey there, Crossroads family. Hey, how's everybody doing? We are so glad to join you online tonight. We are excited about the message from God's word that you're gonna get to hear in a little bit. But we wanted to just uh, remind you that we have resumed live in-person services on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1045. So as soon as you feel comfortable, we invite you to come and join us, worship together. We really hope to see you there soon. Absolutely. And due to the recent DHMs that have, have come out from our mayor's office, uh, we are now uh, requiring in accordance with that DHM for everybody who comes in to wear uh, a mask. So uh, if you've got your mask, make sure you bring it. If you come and join us on Sunday morning, otherwise we'll have one available for you. Uh, just make sure you're wearing it when you come in. And uh, once you get your seat, you can take it off. Uh, but as you're moving around throughout the church, we'd love for you to be able to uh, make sure you uh, are wearing that mask. But that being the case, we look forward to being able to seeing you in person soon uh, as you feel comfortable. But for now, let's engage in worship. Let's uh, praise the Lord for all the good things that he is doing, that he continues to do. Let's give him all the praise that we've got wherever you are located tonight. And uh, we just believe you're going to receive a very special word from the Holy Spirit. And so that's our prayer tonight. And let's jump in and, and engage in the service together.
fills me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will see of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will see of the goodness of God I love your voice oh you have led me through the fire in darkest night oh you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I in the goodness of God oh, All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see of the good
you. Hey, good morning, Crossroads family. Welcome, welcome. I see mostly faces I recognize, but if you're new here today, yay, thanks for coming. We know you could be a lot of places, so thanks for joining us here this morning. If you are new, after the service, go right out these doors to the right, to the Welcome Center. There'll be someone there that wants to get to know you a little bit and give you a little gift, so make sure to stop by there. Um, anyway, wow, what a beautiful morning it is, right? This doesn't feel like August right now, does it? Woke up, it's so beautiful. So, yay. I just am super blessed by that. If you didn't know this already, August is our month of prayer right now at Crossroads. Um, so if you haven't been a part of that yet, we really want you to jump in with us. Every Monday through Friday, 5 to 6 p.m., is prayer right here, open prayer for anybody to come. So even if you can only stop by for five minutes or 50 minutes or whatever, um, please make sure to stop by. Yes, and you threw them 9 to 10.30 on Sunday mornings as well. So yay, jump into one of those. If you haven't been yet, it's been awesome, and I'm sure you would enjoy it. So come and join us. Um, lastly, if you are going to worship with offerings or tithes, they can go in the black box back there. You may notice that you don't see Pastor Sean and Miss Beth here today. They're on a little vacation. He's playing some disc golf, so you'll have to ask him when he gets back how, how his tournament went. Anyways, we have a special, special treat this morning to hear Mr. Phil share his heart. So thank you, Phil. So I'll just say good morning and good afternoon and good evening to those that are joining us at 6. Good evening to you. Um, so I want to tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in small black churches, Baptist for the most part. And uh, there were times when my dad was an assistant pastor there. And uh, there's even a few times when he pastored uh, some of those churches. And so one of the things that I think about, I continue to think about, is uh, growing up in those churches, and I remember the music. Now, they were small churches, so we didn't have very many people there. Uh, but as I'm thinking about it, I always remember, at least for me, the music was always good for me. And uh, probably the thing that helped make the music good is that usually they at least had one or maybe two voices that were really good. I was not one of those people. <laughs> and uh, if you ever heard me sing, you would know why I was not one of those people. Um, we, uh, one of the songs that we sang was called Lead Me. And uh, I find myself singing that, probably not out loud, even when I'm by myself, that doesn't go well. And so I find myself singing that, humming that, remembering the words to that. And so as the start of our prayer this morning, I'm just going to read you some of the chorus to that. And uh, you can bet I'm playing that in my head. Yeah, because church isn't over yet. That's why. It goes like this. Lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Lord, let me walk each day with you. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. Father, that's our heart's cry today, is that you would lead us and guide us along the paths that you have placed us on. Father, I pray that you would open up our eyes, hmm. that we might see you more clearly, follow you more closely, love you more dearly, day by day. 
Father, I pray that you would place within our hearts your plans and your purposes for our lives. And that you would help us to always remember, Father, always, that you love us, that you care for us, that your heart beats for us, and that you are for us. And that you would continually draw us nearer and nearer to you. Father, I also pray specifically for this time that we're together right now. I pray specifically, Father, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to feel what you are saying and what you are doing today in this moment. Father, help us to follow you with all that we have and everything that we are. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, when I was growing up, I uh, would think about my life. And when I say think about my life, what I wanted it to be, what uh, I would have pictures in my head that I would create of things that I wanted my life to be like. And uh, this would cover just, just all areas of life for me. And right now, I am thinking of a specific area, and that specific area is that of uh, vehicles. Uh, I have never been a car guy, all right? I am not a car guy. And uh, I like cars. I enjoy cars, especially when they work, or especially when I'm around people who know how to make them work. I really like that. But I am not a car guy. But I had a picture of the kind of vehicles that I wanted to have in my adult life. Uh, so the, one of the first times that I came to realize this was when I was in uh, high school. And uh, I had two vehicles in my head, okay? I had, and because I'm a weird, I'm not a weird, I'm goofy. More than weird, I'm goofy. And uh, uh, so, uh, the, the, the first picture that I had, so I'm a high schooler. A high schooler shouldn't be thinking like this. But the first picture that I had in my head was a conversion van. <laughs> now, there's a reason that I had that picture in my head. Not a good reason. And I think I have finally outgrown this. I don't know. Sometimes I still wonder. Uh, the reason I had this conversion van thing going on in my head is because when I was in high school, sad to say, two people that were my heroes were secret agents, and those secret agents would be Dean Martin played a guy called Matt Helm, if you're old enough to remember Dean Martin, and the other guy was, unfortunately, James Bond. And so I had those thoughts in my head. Dean Martin drove this. He had actually a station wagon but I needed more space than a station wagon. He had this station wagon that had all kinds of gizmos and buttons in it, and, all, and he did all kinds of stuff in there. And, and you know what? James Bond was just cool. And the vehicles he drove were just cool, but they were just little, so I needed to expand to a conversion van. <laughs> so anyway. Those are the things that I had in my heart. The other one, the other one, and I don't have any idea because my folks were not like this. I was not like this. I don't know where this idea came from, and I can't put this on God. I can't because I don't think he has that. Well, I don't know if he does or not. Anyway, uh, I wanted me, I wanted to have me, hmm, and I'm not talking myself into it right now, but I wanted to have me a Winnebago RV. I thought that would have been the coolest thing ever. A Winnebago RV. And, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that, really, those thoughts carried me further in my adult life than they should have carried me. And, and it made a difference on the cars that I wanted. I don't want to say that we, because I don't want to throw Terry under the bus with me. <laughs> but it was her money that paid for the cars, so. <laughs> anyway, 
uh, I had that picture in my head on how I thought life should be when it came to vehicles. And then as I got older and I began to get more serious, I began to think I should have some other pictures in my head on how I think life should be. And so what I began to do then is I began to ask myself questions. And uh, <clears throat> what I want to share with you today, there's two sets of questions that I ask myself. They're all the same question. I just ask myself in different ways. Um, there's two sets of questions that I continue to ask myself uh, about my picture in life. And my hope is that sometime today and going forward, that you will ask yourself these same questions, all right? And then hopefully, <laughs> if you are answering them the right way, then let your life reflect that. And you'll see that picture. It may take a while, because it's taken a while with me. And sometimes I think I go backwards more than I go forwards. But I have this picture. Uh, the first two questions would be, what was I created for? What is my purpose in life? And then the other two questions, so the second group of questions, would be, what is it that turns my crank? What is it that I really desire, that I really, really want? What is it? that just excites me? What do I crave? What do I crave? And so for the first set of questions, uh, I bought a book uh, years and years ago. We were on a trip someplace, and I don't remember where we were going. I just remember that we stopped at this gas station uh, to get some gas and to go to the bathroom and stuff. And as I'm looking around in the gas station, they had that Christian book display. You've been there where they have Christian type books and, and sometimes I just go and look at those shelves to see what they have and sometimes it's, those things are, titles are familiar and sometimes they're not. Well, I was, my, my eyes went to this book uh, probably because it had this big sticker on this book and that sticker said 99 cents. So now you know me real good. You know that I like secret agents that I shouldn't like, and you know that I'm cheap. <laughs> the book was Knowing God by J.I. Packer. I'd never heard of J.I. Packer until that moment. But when I seen that book, and I seen that it was 99 cents, and I said, I can buy God for 99 cents. I ought to get that book. So. I got the book. And uh, he answers those questions. Actually, he asks a bunch of questions, and he answers a bunch of questions in that book. But he answers those questions uh, about when it comes to what was I created for and what's my purpose. For him, what was I created for? To know God. For him, what's my purpose in life? To know God. If you'll turn to uh, John, the 17th chapter. Um, John, the 17th chapter, has, um, oh, what do I want to say? It is a story about Jesus. It's the continuing story about Jesus. And it's the middle part. It's the transitioning part of the story about Jesus going to the cross. For me, it is. And uh, what the 17th chapter is, is Jesus is saying a prayer. Now, before he says this prayer, they've had the Passover meal. And as they've had the Passover meal, 
uh, they finished that, and, and they're getting ready to go to the garden to pray. And so when I think about that, I think about uh, Dick, who was here last week and preached. And uh, he read a, a verse out of Acts. And I'm sorry I didn't look that up before I came. But it says, on their way to pray. And as I was getting ready for this, and I'm, I'm reading this, all of a sudden the thought, because I'm not smart enough to have this myself come to me, the thought came to me. Jesus was on his way to pray. And what did he do? He prayed. And I just had to stop. He's getting ready to go pray, guys. But before he goes to pray, the way that he gets ready to pray is by praying. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, in this prayer, there's three things that he prays for in this prayer. First of all, verses 1 through 5, he opens up and he prays for himself. And then verses, uh, let me turn my page here. Verses 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples. And then verses 20 through the end of the, uh, through the, end of the chapter, he prays for all believers. All right? So that's how he breaks that prayer up. Uh, I'm really focusing on verse 3, but I'm going to start with verse 1 because it's just really hard. This is a hard thing. Sometimes you can jump into the middle of a scripture and be okay, but I, this one is just difficult. So we'll just start with uh, the first verse. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So when we talk about what were we created for, what's our purpose in life, that is to know God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's what he wants more than anything else, is to know him. And he says that this is eternal life. So that means that this is not just about this life that we're living right now, but that means that when we stop living in this realm and we move into our, I'm going to say our real realm, when we move into that, knowing God is still going to be important. We can start that here. In fact, he wants us to, encourage us to, us to start that here. But this thing about knowing God, that's a big deal, guys. And it's real important. And so Jesus said, that's what I want, is that they would come to know the only true God and Jesus whom you have sent. And that's eternal life. Knowing him is what gets us to eternal life. I want to turn to uh, Hosea. Okay. Hosea, the sixth chapter. And I'm really wanting the sixth verse, but because the first three verses are just real good, I'm going to read those. Yeah, if my fingers can do that. Okay. Hosea, the sixth chapter, the first verse. Come. Let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. And after two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will restore us, that we 
may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. The word, for me, the word acknowledge is just another version of the word knowledge, which is another version of what we're talking about today, knowing. So it says here, let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. For as surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that the water that water the earth. And then uh, I come down here to sixth verse, the sixth verse. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. So I'm going to put these verses together here, but the first thing I want to say is if I'm looking at verse 6 and I'm reading in between the lines, to me what it's telling me is that God wants us to know him, and that's more important than, as it says here, sacrifice, and that's more important than offerings. He wants us to know him. And then if I put that sixth verse with what the first three verses say, it says, come, let us return to the Lord. Well, I'm not going to do the whole thing on Hosea, but when it says, come, let us return to the Lord, you know what, guys? We have a hard time in life sometimes. I mean, sometimes we just get slapped upside our head and we don't know how to recover. That's what happens to us sometimes. And in times like that, sometimes we say, where is God? Why isn't he doing something? Why isn't he hearing my prayers? And on top of us thinking he's not hearing our prayers, when we pray, this is a pretty high ceiling, but they don't even get to this high of a ceiling. If we're in an eight-foot room, ceiling-wise, we don't even feel that they get up that high. And this is what he says. Come and let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces. But you know what? He will heal us. Sometimes we spend all of our time fixed on the tearing and how much we hurt and how much pain we're in. I'm thinking that we should be fixing our eyes or fixing ourselves on the part where it says, but he will heal us because he does may not look the way that you want it to look. It may not be the way that you want it to be. But I'm telling you, he does heal us. Then it says, but he will bind up our wounds. And, and like I said, he has injured us. Let me go back here. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Have you ever felt just like you were just beat up? And sometimes you just, if people could see on the inside of you, you'd just be one big open wound or sore. And if you were looking for some little Band-Aid to patch that thing, you'd say, uh-uh. And not even a whole box would help you patch that thing up. You ever feel that way? It says, but he will bind up our wounds. And he does. He does. It may not look the way that you want it to look. It may not be the thing that you've been crying out for. But I'm telling you, God knows how to keep his own, and he knows how to take care of his own. And he's in the business of keeping. And so then it continues on after that. After two days, he will revive us. So that's telling me that this stuff is going to come to an end at some point. Again, it may not be what we want it to be, but I'm telling you, it will come to an end. And then he will revive us. And on the third day, he will restore us. And then it, says, then it says like this. The reason he does that, the reason he heals up, the reason he binds up our wounds, the reason that he revives us is so that we may live in his presence. Because that's what he wants. He wants us to be in his presence. 
He lives for us to be in his presence. And he wants us to enjoy being with him. And then he's, now he's, he's, he's promising us that he's going to do this. How does he do that? He says, as surely as the sun rises, he will appear. So it's going to happen because the sun is going to come up. Even though, there's not gonna, even though it appears that there's not going to be Nebraska football, the sun is going to rise up in the morning. Sometimes I don't know if I got that. But, <laughs> but it's going to come up. Uh, uh, Pastor Dan, uh, <laughs> bless his heart. One day, Nebraska, after one of the losses they had, and so losses were rare back in those days. One of the days when Nebraska had lost a game, he came in and he started off his sermon something like this. This is, this is my paraphrase of what he did. He looked outside. He said, hey, guys, what's the sun? Well, it's up in the sky. You mean Nebraska lost and the sun still came up? And then he had the nerve to preach a sermon after that. <laughs> All right. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the rent winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. And when I think of the spring rains, I think about how when we get those things, everything starts turning green. Everything that looked dead now looks alive. Life is coming forth. And that's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. And you know what? We go down to verse 6. What God wants is us, for us to know him. Let's turn to Jeremiah, the ninth chapter. The ninth chapter, the 23rd and 24th verses. Again, we're talking about God wanting us to know him, and he wants to know us. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and he knows me. Who is me? God. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. So all those things in verse 23, they can represent the things that we all want. If you want to call that the American dream, we can call it the American dream. They represent the things that we want, that we desire, that we want to go after, that we feel like we need and that we should have. And then he comes down here to verse 24. He says, don't, don't boast in that. That's, that's, not, that's not life. That's not the key. But boast in this, that you understand and understanding is paired with knowing him. Well, what are we supposed to know? What are we supposed to understand about him? That he exercises kindness, that he exercises judge, uh, justice, and that he exercises righteousness on this earth. So he does those things here, and he does those things for us. Because this is what he delights in. This is what he wants. He not only wants us to know him, but to understand him. I'm thinking of uh, Joni. You guys know who I mean by Jody? Yeah, Joni Erickson Tata. I'm thinking of her. Thank you. And... Um, when she had that accident, and I would imagine, I, I mean, I, I've not heard her story in a long time, but I would imagine that there was, whether it was a short period or a long period, 
I would imagine that there was a period of time when she didn't feel like God was just. I'm imagining that there was a period of time when she couldn't see kindness and what had happened to her. I'm imagining that she couldn't see the justice of the whole thing. That's what I'm thinking. Now, I don't know. Maybe she says different. But if that was me, that's what I'd have been thinking. You put that today, and she would say that God is kind, that he is just, and that he is righteous. And she would not only say that I delight in God because I understand him and I know him. She sees the big picture. She would not only say that she delights in him, but she would also say that God delights in her. That's what he wants, guys. He wants us to love him. He wants us to know him. And you know what? It's going to be hard to love him if we don't know him. It's going to be hard for us to know him if in our knowledge of him and our getting to know him, we don't begin to understand him. It's going to be difficult. And even when we do, sometimes that's difficult too. I want to talk to you. Uh, you know what? I want to share something with you here. This is, I'm hoping that I want to share something with you. And I guess I'm not going to share something with you. I am going to share something with you. <laughs> and I'm not going to sing it, although it's playing in my head. This is a song that was done by Graham Kendrick. Graham Kendrick, he is a uh, songwriter singer. He is out of England. And uh, in my head, I want to say that he did this song in the 90s. And I think if, if that's the case, then it had a rebirth around 2010. This is a song that I hear in my head oftentimes. I want to read to you some of the words of this song. All I once held dear built my life upon. All this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing, for you're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn, that all-surpassing gift of righteousness. And then again, the chorus. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best. You're my joy. You're my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. I think that sums up what we're talking about when we talk about knowing God. I want to move to... Uh, the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, we have the story of Moses. And uh, I encourage you, if it has been a while since you have read the book of Exodus, I would really encourage you to go back and read that again and read about Moses. Um, the piece that I'm taking out of this, and it, it, it is just a piece, but it's a big piece. The piece that I'm taking out of this is how Moses lived his life. 
And uh, when I'm looking through, I'm studying, and this isn't the first time I've studied this passage, uh, because this is one of my favorite passages. Uh, and this passage begins in 33, Exodus 33, verse 7. That's where the passage begins, all right? And it just seems like people just skip over this like it's nothing, like it's just a little thing. Let's just get on with life. And uh, for me, this is a big thing. It's a real big thing. This piece of the story, in the context of the book, this piece of the story actually begins in the 19th chapter of Exodus, okay? And you could really go back. I mean, it's part of the whole book, but it begins in the 19th chapter. In the 19th chapter, uh, Moses and God are hanging out together. They're speaking to each other as if it was face-to-face. They're hanging out together. And uh, God and Moses are speaking, and God says... I want to make a covenant with you and the nation of Israel. And he says, now, I've already made this covenant, but I want to reconfirm it again. And he says this. He says, you are my treasured possessions. And see, we, don't, we think, oh, that's, that's nifty. That means that, that God really liked them. Well, yeah. He really did like them. He really does like us. But there's a little bit more involved than that. Okay? It's almost as if he had bought and paid for them. If we talk about Grady's sermon from a couple of weeks ago, one of the ways that people would look at that term, a treasured possession, because this was a term that was used during that time, one of the ways that people would look at it would be that A king has come, and he's decided to take you in, and you're no longer a part of the kingdom that you were in. So we're talking about being a part of the kingdom of God here. You're a treasured possession. And he said, if you'll do the things that I ask you to do, I will do the things that I'm telling you I will do. And then he mentions stuff about sickness and disease and all that kind of stuff. All that comes up in this, this, this section or in this story. So that's how this thing starts out. And so God says, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. So we're going to seal the deal on this thing. I'm going to come and visit you all. So Moses said, okay. He said, see that mountain there? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to visit you on that mountain. So he said, this is how you tell the people to prepare, and in three days I'm coming. So God comes down, and he inhabits that mountain. Oh, my goodness. That's no little thing. And some people say, well, why did God want to do this? Well, no, 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 let me back up. He did this in the context of what the people would understand, the significance of what was taking place. He came and he showed his power. I mean, that thing shook like there was an earthquake going on. And the people felt that under their feet. They heard a trumpet blasting and blaring away. That means come and see this. Come and be a part of this. And you know what the supernatural thing about that was? Ain't nobody blowing a trumpet or a horn. Nobody's doing that. That was God calling his people to himself. And there's lightning and thunder going on and there's smoke billowing up and this cloud. I mean, this was a magnificent display of God being God. And then Exodus 20, verse 1. Doesn't skip a beat. Exodus 20, verse 1. Guess what? God starts talking and they can all hear that. He is speaking to them the Ten Commandments. I mean, he just starts talking. What God in the the history of the world, what God has ever done that? Oh, yeah, people talked about, oh, our gods do this and that, you know, Greek mythology and all that kind of stuff. There ain't nobody that ever heard their God speak like that, not like that. There ain't no God that showed up. I mean, they had tales about that, but ain't nobody actually seen God show up and just do all that God stuff. None of them heard that stuff before. And here's God on the scene, 
letting the people know, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. And if you will do these things, we will enter into this covenant. So then he says, Moses, I want you to come up here. So Moses came up into the mountain. And as he's getting ready to go up, the people said, hey, Moses, hey, Moses, Moses, come here, come here. Yeah, what do you want? I got to go see God. Moses, listen, don't do that. You tell God, don't do that anymore. They were terrified. Oh, man, who's ever seen the face of God like that? They were terrified. And they said, you tell God that he can talk to you because evidently you and him are all right. But you don't have him talk to us face to face like that. He talks to you, then you come tell us what God said. And Moses just probably just looked at him and said, fine. <laughs> and he went on up. And he came back down. And he said, this is what we need to do. He went up mountain again, and God speaks to him, gives him the Ten Commandments. Now the written form. This is to seal the deal, the covenant. This is to make this thing a real deal. Now it's, it's written down in the form of the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> As he's coming down, and the reason why he's coming down the mountain now, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason why he's coming down the mountain now is because God said, I can't believe this. We just sealed the deal. And in fact, I, I left this out earlier. He called Moses, Aaron, Nay something, Nehu, and Abihu, or whatever. He called them up along with 70 elders. And they sat down and they had a meal with God. I mean, they sat in his presence and had a meal with God. That's how they sealed covenants back in that day. Like today, you hear of people saying, here, let's rub our hands together. I don't want to, no, just tell me you promised to do what you said you're going to do. Or we have people, <clears throat> excuse me, we have people that cut and then they mingle their blood together. It, it, it don't cut on me, first of all. <clears throat> excuse me. Don't cut on me, first of all. And second of all, I'm really not interested in your blood unless I'm dying and it's coming from a hospital. Okay? And so that's what they're... But, but these guys, they're practical. They sit down and they share a meal together. That's a wonderful thing. I like that. I'll show up for that kind of a closing the deal kind of thing. Okay? And so he says, I'm done with them. I'm going to kill them and make you a great nation. And Moses just said, you can't do that. So then he comes down and he sees the people. And then we get to the 33rd chapter. And in the 33rd chapter, it tells us a story about Moses. I'm going to call it his daily routine. Seventh verse. He comes out of his tent and he had set up a tent outside the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. And it says that he would go out there. The way I picture it is like this. I mean, I'm sure it has different looks to it. But I picture it as he's walking out in the early morning hours. The sun's up, but he's walking out in the early morning hours. And people are getting up. And as he's passing by their tents, they're out there and they're stretching their morning stretch. And, and, and they're drinking their <clears throat> coffee or whatever it is that they drink. They're drinking their little deal, and, and Moses walks by, and they stop. That's Moses. Where's he going? He's going out to the tent. Family, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, family. Come here, come here, come here. Why, we got to get out of bed. Because Moses is going to the tent. Why is that such a big deal? I want to go back to bed. Because he's going to the big tent. To talk to God. Well, I'm not going to be there. How will I know? Watch, you'll see. So he gets to the tent. And when he gets to the tent, the cloud, a cloud by day, fire by night, the cloud moves over and comes and sits down. I'm going to say in front of the door. Whoa. 
check. You might be saying, well, Phil, what's the big deal? Because Moses is on the inside and God's on the outside in front of the door. So that means Moses can't get out until God's done with him. Man. We pick it up, verse 11. We get to verse 11. Oh, man, I didn't change. All right, verse 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. And Moses said to the Lord, so that's telling you about his routine. One of the times when he's doing his routine, after the whole calf thing, this is what God's, this is what Moses is talking to God about. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Verse 14, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, I'm going to stop there, but if you want to get the rest of the story, you read on into 34, about down to first, verse 7, 10, someplace around in there. And then if you want the rest of the story, you finish out the book of Exodus. Because what you see happens to Moses is, is supernatural. And it comes from him being in the presence of the living God. How do we know that God's living? Because he came and inhabited that, 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 that mountain. The thing I'm wanting you to get from this is this. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. The thing that I want you to get from this is this. Moses said, you tell me that you like me. You tell me that you know me. And you tell me that you ple that pleases you. He said, if that's the case, then what I want you to do is let me know you. Show me your ways. He didn't say, show me your acts. See, they, 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 they had already been through that. For Moses, that started with the burning bush that didn't burn. And then that continued on with the dividing of the Red Sea. And even before the Red Sea, that continued on with the ten plagues, a mighty display of God. He understood and knew the acts of God, but he, 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 that wasn't enough. He said, I want to know you, your ways. I want to know how you think. I want to know who you are. I want to know what's on the inside of you. I want to know you. That's what he said. God is no different today. He wants us to know him. We are no different. We should be no different than Moses. We want to know him. Paul says, I want to know you and the power that raised you from the dead. Oh, guys, I'm challenging you today to know God. You know how God rewards people that he's happy with? He gives them more of him. I mean, we ask for money, we ask for, for cars, we ask for houses, and, 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 and we ask for stuff. What God wants to reward us with. I mean, he gives us that stuff. He provides for us. But what he does is he gives us 
more of him. Well, how does he do that? How do I get that? Two things. You can intentionally pray. That's what Moses was doing. What is prayer is talking to God. However you do that. If all you got is a little popcorn kernel on the inside of you, then spin that out real quick. And he'll give you more. He'll draw you in closer. And you will have more bubbling up out from the inside of you. He loves you. He wants you. The second thing is read your Bible. Read the Word of God. Ooh. Isn't that what we call the Bible, the Word of God? Do you know what the Bible's about? It's about God. If you read about God, you have the opportunity to get to know him better. Read your Bible. Mm. I'm going to uh, pray. Challenge has been given. Get to know God and allow him. Cooperate with that process. Allow him to know you because that's on you I mean he knows you and you might say well why if he already knows me why what's what's the problem the problem is is you're not cooperating with him you you need to get you you, you need to open yourself up right. father we come to you today We are so thankful and grateful. We are humbled to be here in your presence today, Father. Our heart's desire is that you would come and you would dwell within us greater than you've ever done before. And Father, as you put out your arms and say, come, that we will come and not be afraid and that we will talk to you as one friend talks to another friend. And we will ask you, show us your ways that we might know you and know how to please you. Father, we thank you. In Jesus, we pray. Amen.